Fabulous. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, today's session is on my favorite Q2 Forex trades. Before I begin, though, I'd like to share with you this disclaimer. And um, I basically encourage you to pause the screen and read the disclaimer yourself. Um, basically, it says that there's a risk of loss in trading Forex and therefore may not be suitable for all investors. So please um, go through the risk-related trading currencies and be mindful of them. So our topic today is my favorite Q2 Forex trades. And um, I've got quite a few of them. And i um, got an opinion on the Euro, the Yen, the British Pounds, the commodity currencies. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with my favorite trades, which, you know, uh, may not be the one that you are most interested in because it may not be the euro or the yen, but we'll work down from there in terms of um, which trades I like the most or have the highest confidence in down to the ones I'm watching um, that may take a little more time to transpire. So what I want to start off with is I want to start off by showing you my um, charts. So please just confirm to me, because I can't see your view, that um, you are seeing my um, chart of the euro dollar right now. Okay, fabulous. But we're not going to talk about the euro dollar right now. We're going to talk about the British pounds. And, you know, more specifically, um, I like the pound um, as a trade more against the euro than against um, the U.S. dollar. One of my favorite trades for the um, second quarter, of course, you know, these are my opinions um, only, um, is basically to um, sell the British pound against the euro and to sell the British pound against um, the U.S. dollar. Now, the reason why I like this trade is, which is first and foremost, I don't know if um, you caught um, what happened over the weekend, which is that Fitch downgraded um, the UK sovereign debt rating um, from triple A to double A plus. So, you know, basically it's reinforcing the story that fiscal finances in, um, in the UK are quite um, poor. And um, the story here is that if you take a look at this um, chart of the British pound, what you'll notice is that um, in the first quarter, we saw you know, a nice run-up of the euro against the British pounds, meaning euro pound sort. But in the month of March, um, we saw a deep pullback in euro pounds. And I think that um, in April, May, and June in the second quarter, what you're going to begin to see is um, more and more strength in euro pounds, more specifically weakness in the British pounds. Um, also, same story with the pound dollar. I think that you know the pound dollar. There's a very good possibility that 154 was the, is the top in the pound, with the possibility of a move down to 150. So now let's talk about why I like um, selling pounds. You know, first and foremost, what we have to um, understand is. Um, what drove the British pounds um, lower in the first in the first quarter? Sense um, basically for most of the first quarter, I mean, the sterling had been a very strong downtrend, but it bottomed out in the beginning of March um, after the Bank of England revealed concerns about inflation. And the first half of the year, um, it was basically the desire to diversify away from. Um, uh, Sorry, it was basically the improvements in the U.S. economy that drove investors into the U.S. dollar. And the first half, of the first quarter, what people were anticipating was that the Bank of England was going to ease. But then between March and April, we saw um, the BOE come out and so it basically, you know, provide some concerns about how they were worried that the weakness of the British pound was going to cause inflation. So that led people to think, okay, you know, data from the UK hasn't been all that great, but um, perhaps the Bank of England um, is not going to um, ease monetary policy or increase quantitative easing because they're worried about inflation. So that led to the bit of a recovery in the um, British pounds between March um, and April. However, we believe that their reluctance to ease is only going to be temporary. Um, as you may know, BOE Governor King is stepping down at the end of June, and barring any major financial crisis, um, a change um, in monetary policy before he leads office, leaves office is probably going to be slim. 
The game changer will come when Mark Carney takes office. And Mark Carney, you may know, is the current um, Bank of Canada governor, and he's going to be the new BOE governor at the end of June. So Carney has been tasked with basically coming into um, his post and doing all that he can to transform, um, you know, transform the economy and actually pull it out of its slump. So what is he going to? What is, are his first choices? You know, what is he going to do? Well, you know, most of his efforts will be centered on providing more stimulus to the economy. Now, some people anticipated that stimulus come in the first quarter under King's Watch. It didn't. So now um, there's a very good chance that the BOE's QE program is going to be delayed until August um, instead of May. Um, so there's a very good possibility that going into the um, initiation of Carney, who takes office in the end of June, beginning of July, that people are going to start to think that the new BOE under Carney is going to be a much more dovish central bank. So the foundation of you know my near term my near term negative outlook for the pound is that the UK's combination of no to low growth, we've already seen quite a bit of weakness in economic data, wage growth has been non-existent, retail sales has been very weak. This um, week we have UK GDP numbers and while there's, um, the market's looking for a little bit of an increase in um, first quarter GDP growth, Bank of um, England's policymaker Wheel came out last week and said, you know, I wouldn't rule out the possibility of um, negative GDP growth in um, the UK in the first quarter. And if we do get negative GDP growth, I'm going to pull up my Bloomberg screen for a second and pull up um, the GDP reading, what you'll notice is that if we do get negative GDP growth in the first quarter, that would be the f um, fifth out of the last six quarters that um, the UK economy contracted. Even if we get the modest growth that people are expecting, 0.1%, it's really anemic. So at the end of the day, you know, UK's combination of no and low growth um, is a very strong reason for the BOE to ease. Now, of course, the BOE has been worried about inflation, but um, you may also know that commodity prices have fallen quite a bit over the past um, couple of weeks. Um, if you take a look at the um, chart of oil prices, which I'm pulling up right now in my Bloomberg chart, you'll see that at the beginning of April, oil prices were $97 a barrel. Now they're $87 a barrel. So inflationary pressures are beginning to ease, and that will give the Bank of England flexibility to also um, consider increasing monetary stimulus. So the combination of you know stagnant growth in next and essentially, and you know um, easing inflationary pressures. I think is really going to help, um, you know, finally lead to a top, to help the pound finally lead to a top and possibly sell off quite a bit in the second quarter going into the third quarter. Um, but in terms of, you know, targets um, for the move, um, you know, we know that the pound dollar right now has some support at 152. But um, the more significant support is going to be at 150. So the reason um, why we're looking for additional pounds weakness is because we think the BOE is going to embark on another round of policy easing. But of course, we need some triggers for um, for the market to you know think that way as well. So the first potential trigger is on is on the BOE uh, minutes on May sorry BOE meeting on May 9th followed by the release of the minutes of May 22nd. Now, first and foremost, the BOE is not expected to alter monetary policy on May 9th, but um, when the minutes are released on May 22nd, I think that there's a very good chance that inflation expectations will um, kind of decline a little bit or they won't be as agitated about inflation um, because of the recent movements in commodity prices. And um, they're going to be more worried about growth because they have very good reasons to be more worried about growth. So, you know, that's going to all be running up to the lead up of Mark Carney taking office at the end of June, beginning of July. So the new, ch new um, you know, BOE governor is expected to adopt a much more flexible um, stance on monetary policy and basically look to resume QE 
which um, would you know coincide with um, more weakness in the pound. So why are we looking at um, August? And the reason why we're looking at August is because usually the Bank of England likes to make um, major changes in monetary policy around the time when they release their quarterly inflation report. So their next quarterly inflation report is due um, in the, the month of August. And so there's a very good possibility that they could change um, that they could change their their inflation and their um, growth forecast in that inflation report. And that um, could be the foundation or the um, forum that the BOE uses to essentially signal a potential change in monetary policy. But overall, the point I want to make is that if you take a look at um, UK economic data in general, and I'm going to pull up um, uh, just a table showing you how data has changed, what you'll notice here is working backwards, we've seen a 0.8% decline in retail sales. We've seen um, average weekly earnings growth slow from 1.2% to 0.8%. Um, in terms of the unemployment rate in the UK, it's increased from 78 to 7.9%. Inflationary pressures did slow a bit in the month of March. It's probably only going to slow a bit in the month of April. The visible trade balance um, also widened significantly. So overall, we've seen quite a bit of weakness in UK data. And the only thing that's holding the Bank of England back from you know, easing now is inflation. And because you know, inflationary pressures are abating, I think that there's a very good possibility that um, the BOE is growing more and more dovish, and that could lead to um, you know, more weakness in the past. So one of my favorite trades, my first favorite trade in um, in uh, the second quarter is to sell the pound um, basically for a move down to 150 over um, the next uh, you know couple months if not sooner and then um, for the possibility of euro pounds maybe getting up to um, 87 cents um, as a result of euro pounds weak uh, sorry pounds weakness so that's on uh, one uh, trade that I'm looking at the next trade that I'm looking at um, is in the euro. So you know, there's a couple of interesting things that are happening in the euro right now. First and foremost, um, you, you know, we've come off the heels of um, the Cyprus bailout, and the euro has remained, you know, quite stable despite the fact that, um, you know, the Cyprus bailout caused quite a bit of anxiety in the FX markets. Over the weekend, we had Italy. Um, finally re you know, elect a president, and um, after five failed um, rounds of votes, they finally decided to re-elect um, Giorgio Napolit Napolitano, who is the current president for another term. Now, it could have gone really bad, meaning that you know, if they were unable to vote um, for a president and the markets opened on Monday with that reality, um, we could have seen um, a very deep sell-off in the euro. But if you look at how um, the markets opened, I'm pulling up an hourly chart um, of the euro dollar, we did see a gap higher in the euro um, when it opened on um, Sunday afternoon, Monday morning in Europe for trading. And the reason why it gapped higher was because, um, you know, the election of the Italian president basically um, removed a potentially large destabilization risk for the euro. Because what it means is that by electing the re-electing the president, the um, coalition between there's the different parties, political parties in Italy, um, one are basically um, voting for an attempt to form a new government. Because you know by failing to um, have his candidates um, that he was supporting win the election. Bersani, who's the leader of the Democratic Party and the person who, quote unquote, supposedly won the um, Italian elections back in February, was forced to step down. And so the Democratic Party is now looking for um, his successor. And his successor will most likely be someone who is much more amenable to forming a coalition ber with Berlusconi. So, you know, the local papers in Italy are reporting that one of the conditions for Napolitano's um, decision to um, take office for the second term is the first time ever that a, a president has served two terms is um, 
that the current political parties are willing to work together and basically um, you know, form a new government. So my, the point that I'm trying to make is that there's a very good chance we're not going to see another round of elections in the summer in Italy. There's a very good chance we'll get some good news um, on the Italian political front and that we'll finally um, have a new government form with a clear-cut prime minister. And that in of itself will help to eliminate a near-term uncertainty for the euro. Now, um, in terms of um, why the euro is selling off today. Um, the reason why the euro is selling off, even though we have some positive developments in the um, in the um, Italian political front, is because you know there's a good possibility that the ECB is getting more and more serious about um, about cutting interest rates. Now, the ECB is a central bank that loves to prepare the market for any uh, potential changes in monetary policy. So. Um, two weeks ago, ECB President Draghi came out and said that um, there's a very good possibility that um, you know, there's more downside risk than upside risk to the Eurozone. He's worried about economic data. He's worried about how the economy will perform. ECB um, policymaker Weidman, who's also the head of the German Bundesbank, last week um, reiterated that you know, a rate cut is possible. Over the weekend, we had more comments. Basically, um, ECB member Asmussen, um, said that while effectiveness, the rate cuts is limited, um, if new information warrants it, you know, they could, um, you know, cut interest rates. And then ECB member Knott also said that the, that the data coming in has shown that the risk is to the downside. So, you know, it certainly sounds like these ECB officials are warming to the idea of an interest rate cut. So it all rests on this week's German IFO and, um, this week's German IFO and PMI numbers. If the data, which is the data that the ECB is watching, does surprise to the downside, because right now the market is expecting you know, just a very, very small um, deterioration, pretty much unchanged. If it does surprise to the downside, uh, that could accelerate speculation of an ECB rate cut and drive the euro not only below 130, which is its current um, support level, but maybe as far down as 128.50. So, um, as I said, you know, the ECB is, you know, right now thinking about um, or leaning towards cutting interest rates, um, you know, due to weaker economic data and any lingering concerns about um, a recession. And if the data validates that, um, there, and you will know by the end of this week um, that if that's the case, we'll not only see a one-day sell-off in the euro, um, we could see a much deeper um, sell-off in the euro, maybe even as down um, to 128.50, maybe even lower. So potential, potential triggers for movement in the euro, we have the ECB meeting on May 2nd and June 6th. Um, there's a greater chance that something will happen on June 6th and May 2nd. Um, we also have um, the Italian uh, election, the Italian, the evolving Italian um, election situation for prime minister, and um, Napolitano is expected to, you know, come out of the gate running, even though he's an 87-year-old man, and he's expected to come out and, you know, quickly, um, quickly, you know, try to form this new government. So we should know in the next month or two. But um, I do like the euro to the downside um, against the U.S. dollar, um, particularly since. Um, you know, the Federal Reserve, the next step they will take, even though it may not be immediate, is going to be um, you know, to taper asset purchases, whereas the ECB, the next step they will take um, would be to cut um, interest rates. So you know, there's a very clear distinction between where these two central banks are going. <clears throat> Dollar yen, <coughs> apologize for that. I seem to have a frog in my throat. Now, I also um, like dollar yen quite a bit. Dollar yen's obviously struggling to break um, above 100. Uh, it failed earlier this month. Its high was 99.94. It failed overnight when it rose to a high of 99.88, and you know basically it's trading you know, significantly lower right now. I would say that anywhere between 96 and 98 is a good value point to come into the euro for a long trade. Um, I wrote a report um, that I published on Thursday talking about the various factors that needed to occur 
for the um, for dollar yen to break a hundred. One of those and those three factors are basically a rise in U.S. yields, an increase in the Nikkei, as well as ja- the Japanese finally buying um, foreign bonds. So, you know, one of the things that's shown is I'm just going to pull up a 10-year um, U.S. yield chart. And what you will see um, is that U.S. yields have fallen quite a bit. And if you um, overlay dollar-yen on top of this, you'll see that um, for uh, most of 2012 into 2013, we had a very nice correlation between U.S. yields and dollar-yen, particularly since the beginning of the year. Let's try to do year-to-date. But there's been a huge divergence lately. And um, this divergence is, you know, basically what, you know, I think is capping the rally in dollar yen. Because typically, because there's such a strong correlation, usually, you know, this correlation uh, eventually resumes with dollar yen falling, yields rising. But, um, you know, because yields are continuing to point lower in the U.S., dollar yen is struggling to rally. So up until the point where we get a rise in U.S. yields, dollar yen may have a very difficult time breaking 100. So what could cause U.S. yields to rise? Well, some good data would certainly help. Um, The reason why we're seeing such a deep sell-off in um, U.S. yields is because we um, had a pretty bad non-farm payrolls report in the U.S. that was followed by also a pretty bad retail sales report. And then um, we just we just had you know you know more and more weakness in U.S. data. So um, dollar yen above 100 would basically require U.S. yields probably back above 175. Also, we've seen uh, we previously had a very nice correlation between the Nikkei which um, did rise quite a bit overnight, and was the reason why dollar yen um, opened, it was trading well during the Asian trading session, but unfortunately, U.S. stocks are down right now, and so that is going to point to a, um, a sell-off, if, we, if the sell-off in U.S. stocks is sustained, in Asia. So um, people are looking at this really, really tight correlation between um, dollar yen, which is the green chart, green line, and um, the Nikkei, which is the white area. They're seeing that um, you know maybe the Nikkei will fall because U.S. stocks are falling um, right now, and they're also saying, okay, you know, until we get a new high in the Nikkei, it may be very difficult for um, dollar yen to break 100. And then finally, you know, people have been saying that, oh, you know. Um, all of this aggressive monetary easing from the Bank of Japan should lead to the Japanese buying foreign bonds. But as we've seen in the data, and this is, I'm going to pull up a chart here, um, April 4th was when the BOJ announced their unprecedented monetary easing. And the week of April 5th, the week of April 12th, the Japanese were net sellers of bonds. Now, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal um, this weekend that basically said that Japan's insurance sector, which holds more than three trillion dollars in assets, begin, begin to shift part of its portfolios into foreign bonds as they seek higher returns. So we're going to need to see that happen, and evidence of that will basically come in the form of you know this this weekly report we get from the Japanese uh, from the Ministry of Finance. When we finally see the Japanese numbers turn positive and the Japanese actually start buying foreign bonds, that is when we'll, start, we'll actually see dollar yen um, uh, have a sustained rally above um, 100. So, you know, that's why dollar yen is struggling. But even though dollar yen is um, struggling right now, you know, it is true that, um, you know, the yen has been bought, that some of the, you know, global concerns about weaker U.S. data and weaker Chinese data um, is, is driving the yen higher, that in the long term, the aggressive monetary easing by the BOJ is expected to push the yen lower. And um, I took a look at the um, interest rate differential from the U.S. and Japan. Um, and basically that's you know, calculated using actual inflation rates. And um, it suggests that if Japan is able to meet its 2% inflation targets, that that would be um, equivalent with the dollar yen level of at least 105. So, um, so you know, 
if there's obviously a lot of stops above 100, if dollar yen manages to break above 100, then um, you know the stops will be taken out. We'll probably see a uh, move up to its next resistance level, which you know I have to show you to the monthly chart. The next resistance level will be this high here, 101.45. So there's no resistance level between 100 to 101.45. But I'm looking for a move from you know closer to um, 103.50, 104 in dollar yen once it breaks 100. And um, I think that. If dollar yen dips to 98, that's when you want to start to potentially look for an entry level to the long side because anywhere between 96 to 98, it may not get as far down as 96, is a good entry level um, to, to buy dollar yen at. So, you know, those are basically, um, you know, my outlook for the euro, the pound, the yen. Now, in the commodity currencies, I just want to talk about this um, briefly. Now, the reason why commodity currencies have fallen so much, you know, first and foremost, we have weaker Chinese data. We also had um, a sharp decline in commodity prices. But I think you know, there's so much yield in the Aussie and the Kiwi, particularly um, the Aussie because it's a more actively traded currency, that, you know, the Aussie, if you, the 102 level is basically um, pretty much the low we've seen in the currency pair for the past 10 months, at, you know, it, Eight to ten months, I would say, and I think that um, 102, I mean 10150 to 102, um, maybe a level that um, would constitute um, a bargain, in my opinion, um, for the Aussie. And let me just uh, take this opportunity to remind you quickly that um, you know it's important for you to go back to the beginning of the slide to look at this, this for those of you that's just joining us um, to read the disclaimer about the risk involved in trading currencies. There's a risk of loss in trading Forex. It may not be suitable for all investors. But nonetheless, the point I want to make is that um, 102 to 101.50 could be um, a level that would represent a bit of a bargain in um, the Aussie dollar because I do believe that the diversification by the Japanese will um, lead to renewed strength um, in the Aussie dollar, and I also believe that the um, pullback in the commodity prices and in Chinese growth is probably going to be um, temporary and um, relatively short-lived because I think that um, we're probably going to see um, a sh that all the stimulus from the global economy and also the decline in commodity prices lead to a little bit of support for um, the global recovery. So between Japanese demand um, for foreign bonds as well as the possibility of short-lived pullback in Chinese growth, and um, you know the the um, and you know kind of the global recovery, maybe in the third and fourth quarter. That 102 to 101.50 would probably be a good level to come in um, to the um, Aussie dollar. Now, potential triggers for um, prices for volatility in the Aussie would be the RBA meeting on the seventh and the. Um, of May and the 4th of June. Of course, this week we've got the Australian CPI numbers. I actually think that these CPI numbers could be stronger because we did have higher commodity prices in the first quarter. And if we do get those stronger CPI numbers, that could certainly support um, the Aussie dollar. And if we do get a recovery in the Aussie dollar, we expect to see a recovery at least to 104 um, in the Aussie dollar. So, you know, now I'd like to open up the floor to some questions that you may have. I see that there's already been some questions uh, posted, and so I'm going to work from the top down to some of the earlier questions. Is new Governor Carney of BOE a uncertainty for the pound? Um, because the pound refuses to fall. I think it's an uncertainty that will drag the pound lower. Um, if you want to talk about tactical positioning, um, I would basically look, I think it would, you would basically, um, two areas to potentially enter in a short pound trade would, um, in my opinion, would be maybe a 154. Um, if it rallies around 153.50, 154, that could be a level to sell the pound or on a break below 152, which actually is my pre preference because I like to sell weakness rather than strength. In FX, I do not think it is. Um, I do not think it's safe to forecast what's going to happen in the future. It's safer to follow a trend when you see one moving. Um, I'm not going to comment on safe or not safe, but I do believe that you know the trend is really your friend in the FX market, and um, there's probably um, it's probably smart to look for opportunities to follow the trend and fade it, which is why I prefer to sell 152 than to sell one uh, retrace maybe 154 in the pound dollar. Um, do you see Euro 137? No, I do not, um, because I am looking for more weakness than strength. 
What are my settings for the double Bollinger Bands? Um, they're basically, the outside band is a 20 period, two standard deviation Bollinger Bands. The inside band is the 20 period, one standard deviation Bollinger Bands. And actually, if you want more on this, I encourage you to just go to this link, bk 4 x Euro, where I teach you how, where I have a free report um, that basically shows you um, how to um, set up Bollinger Bands and then also um, one strat trading strategy using the Bollinger Bands. People expect gold to go down in Q2. So is Aussie. I think gold's fallen quite a bit. So let's take a quick look at gold. I do think it's going to continue lower. Maybe get to um, pulling up a five-year chart. Maybe get to 12. Hundred, but you know it, it did have a really nice retracement today um, because 1400 is a critical uh, support level in the gold. Um, if it goes to 1200, that obviously would be consistent with sell-off in Aussie. Um, but as I said, I think 10 and I do believe Aussie is headed lower um, in the near term, um, and I think that 10150, 102 would be a level to come into long side in um, gold. As I said, more questions by my double Bollinger Band strategy. I teach it often. Maybe I'll do it next month. Um, but if you want to get a little bit of information on it, bkforex.com forward slash euro has a free trading strategy that I have um, that basically um, shows you how to use the old Bollinger Bands to trade. Why is there a correlation between the Nikkei and dollar yen? What's the fundamental reason? The fundamental reason is because it's basically that a weak yen is good for Japanese corporations. So when the yen weakens, it tends to be positive for Japanese stocks. What percentage do you consider yourself a fundamental trader and technical trader? I always use a fusion of both. So I would say I probably um, am 50% fundamental, 50% technicals. How about one, 129 um, in your dollar? Could demands come in there? Most, you know, th there's certainly a possibility that the commands could come in the euro dollar at around 129. And I um, think that, but I think, you know, 128.50 is probably a better level to consider going long euros. Possible risk on day again caused by poor figures? Um, I don't think so. I mean, it certainly looks like we're having a little bit more risk off than risk on today. What's my long-term view in the euro? So um, we already talked about this. I think this is in the short term, um, it really depends upon whether those IFO and PMI reports um, are weak. I think that they may not be so bad, and because um, they may not be so bad, that could postpone talk of ECB easing. But you know, overall, I'm looking for a possibility of a move down to 129. 120 would be a bit of a stretch. Um, I don't think it's going to get as far down as 120. Gold sell on rallies. Um, I would rather sell in the break of, what, of 1400 in gold. Um, there is a recording of this, which I'm sure um, will be up shortly thereafter um, by FX Street. CAD yen, um, you can see a nice series of higher highs and higher lows. This is basically as a result of dollar yen almost exclusively, because if you look at dollar CAD, um, you know, it's pretty much unchanged. So CAD yen, the rally is um, due to um, the rally in dollar yen. If it goes into above the first standard deviation Bollinger Bands um, and closes there, then I think there's a very good chance that it can um, retest these highs at 98.85. Oil. Take a look at this chart in oil. You can see that um, oil sold off quite a bit. I think that it looks like there's a little bit of a... Um, it looks, it looks like it wants to roll over and touch this support level 85. And um, I think that there's a very good possibility that that can happen. You can even see that on um, the candlestick chart, 90s resistance, and it looks like it wants to go down and test 85. Um, I already talked about dollar yen Euro, and euro yen, so I encourage you all to um, re-listen to this recording. I talked about how one of my favorite trades is dollar yen to the upside. Um, actually, we didn't talk about euro yen. Euro yen also looking very much like a dollar yen chart. So, um, in the in the long term, I like um, both dollar yen and um, euro yen's upside, mostly based upon a dollar yen view. And this is more of a long term view. In the short term, you know, 100 is the resistance level, and what I said earlier is that 96, 98 is a good level to come in on long on dollar yen. If another bailout comes out of Europe, do you see a run on the banks being possible after Cyprus mess? 
if it does happen, then, you know, um, it's quite a possibility. But um, I think Slovenia, which seems to be the next hotbed of um, uncertainty, is not in the same um, trouble as Cyprus and therefore um, doesn't see as much of a risk. 100 is definitely the psychological level in the yen and maybe the third time will be the charm. Why are you forecasting a rise in U.S. yields? And then to Q2, a better U.S. economic data starting with Friday GDP. I actually think that Friday's GDP could surprise the downside. Um, what I said earlier is that um, one of the catalyst that is needed for dollar yen to rise above 100 is a rise in U.S. yields. And um, one of the reasons why U.S. yields could rise is because the Beige Book report that was released last week wasn't nearly as um, dovish as, uh, as you know, people had anticipated. So, you know, they basically, you know, said that, you know, led us to believe that the um, weakness in the month of um, March was not necessarily sustained into April. If, you, if you'd like to trade gold short, where would you put a stop loss in the near term? As I said, I'd rather short um, 1400 and stops really depends upon um, your risk tolerance. I mean, if we take a look at gold, we can take a look at where resistance is. And um, you can see that uh, the real resistance level, um, 1465 really doesn't have any significance, it's 1500, um, or actually I would even say this high here, 1487, um, so maybe that was a level you want to consider. Weaker jobs, is weaker jobs a science, possible silencer for Fed winding down QE? I think it's a definite silencer, um, but um, if the Fed were to do anything, it would be probably in, um, in September when um, they have another one, another one of those meetings where they have the press conference and the forecast. Anytime before that, probably won't happen. Any additional questions? So we've already talked about um, all the different potential levels in dollar yen and not, you know, euro dollar. Um, CNBC cancels money in motion, unfortunately. Um, if you want it back, you know, you can email them. If you want to see us on more often or more topics about currencies, you can email them. You know, I came back from my trip in Australia and, and was, uh, was given the sad news. Unfortunately, the sponsors um, didn't want to send a contract, and I guess it's all about the ratings. I do not use the 55 EMA. I prefer the 50, 100, and 200 SMAs. And also, I do like the 20 EMA, though. So as I said, um, if you want to um, learn more about trading the euro, we've got a free guide that teaches you how to trade the world's most um, actively traded, actively transacted currency pair. shows you how um, I talk about the Bollinger Bands and um, one way to basically use it. The FX markets are not really watched that closely with North, by North Korea, um, and I don't think that should just be something that you consider. Any other questions? Same story. You know, India and Pakistan war is not affecting the FX markets. Okay, so um, a lot of these questions, um, like about the pound dollar, um, we basically covered at length in the beginning of this session, so I encourage you to re-watch um, the video. In terms of what I did in Australia, I attended my friend's wedding, and we also had a, um, I also did some media, and I had a private session for um, trading currencies. Um, in terms of the dollar in general, the dollar index, um, what you'll notice is that overall, um, country-specific factors are still impacting currencies very much. Whoops.
country-specific factors are still impacting currencies very much, and I think that that will dominate. So the dollar index you do see quite strong. Kind of looks like the dollar yen chart right now. I think if you, I overlay the dollar yen chart, you'll see that. Um, but you know, not necessarily something that's um, a relationship that's really you know a long-term relationship because you look at the left hand side of the chart, it's not as strong. But overall, you know, like I said. Um, it's more country-specific factors that are mattering right now. All right, so I want to thank you all for participating, and I'm um, sorry for this is a brief session, but um, next month we'll talk about trading strategies. Thank you so much.